care. What's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the word care? Do you think about how you say take care to someone? Or do you think about health care? But do you ever think of care as a service? Or institutions other than hospitals that provide care? The discourse on care within the field of architecture has recently been gaining a lot of traction as ideas about health are expanding beyond the limits of traditional hospitals. I, personally, had not read enough about care and its multiple meanings. So I reached out to my old classmate Fiona Kenny, who is currently doing her doctoral research on the spatial expressions of care, to talk about the history of residential hospices, long-term care facilities, and pediatric respite centers. With the support of the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts, we ask Fiona what care actually means, and what are these environments within which care is provided. I am Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center, a podcast where we highlight contemporary discourses that shape the built environment but do not occupy the center stage in our daily lives. We speak to radical designers, thinkers and change makers who are deeply engaged in redefining the way we live and interact with the world around us. Okay, shall we begin? I'm ready. Doctor in waiting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, you know what? Interestingly, now we're starting on the dot at the time that I thought we were at supposed the right to time. start. Yeah. Yeah. It's just just with his just wait to twenty nine minutes, but it's okay. In in <laughs> yeah. Okay. So since you are the first inaugural episode of season five. And we're broadly looking at the three key words and the three very large discourses in themselves, uh, care, medicine, and health. And I think we were very mindful of not using healthcare as one word, but really separating them out. So mm-hmm. let us actually begin with that word. Um, what is care? How is it different from cure and I mean I was I was going through your your dissertation outline and since you've spent so much time researching and reading about it what what struck to me was I mean this is my understanding that while care can be a process of cure it is not necessarily true otherwise that the idea of cure is not that embedded in the idea of providing care so Mm -hmm. how do those two systems care and cure differ in their intentions and their final goals or their successes Mm -hmm. yeah I mean I think this is often the question at the top of any conversation on this topic and in my opinion the answer is kind of that care means anything everything and as a result it sometimes means nothing like it can refer to like you say forms of labor uh emotion or or affective kind of states Mm -hmm. um it's an ethical framework it also can refer to like structures of exploitation so it's a really unstable concept that you know in any different context means something entirely different um and I I have like a, there's a really fantastic article that was actually written in the nineties that I'm happy to send along, but it's, it's called confronting women's caring. Um, And they talk exactly about this. So, you know, it's been something that people have been confronting for at least 30 years because Mm. they, they uh, discuss the fact that care or caring kind of runs the risk of being too broad to be useful at all, or can also be too narrowly defined when we understand it solely as kind of like maternal care or like the informal care that's provided by women in the home to their families. Hmm. So that's why it's so, it's so great that that's like kind of your first question, because it is really important to be intentional when talking about this stuff. Um, But at least in the context of uh, in which I use it, there's an important distinction firstly between medical and social care. And so Mm. 
Medical care focuses on, um, and I think this is maybe related to the the hesitance to use the word healthcare because I think that kind of aligns itself with with this medical care idea. So it focuses on kind of fixing the body, and we're trying to get towards a state of curedness or like being cured. Um, and so care becomes a means towards that end. So we're going to care for you so that we can get you to a cured state, right? Um, and a lot of care scholars kind of point out that this leads to a really individualistic view of illness. So it's like health problems in my body, for example, are more easily seen as a result of my own kind of um, predispositions or actions or, or anything like that, where social or environmental conditions are ignored. Mm. Um, so then in contrast, social care involves the kind of more relational activities. So uh, even as simple as feeding or having a conversation with someone bathing and this this care is a lot more likely to be carried out by women. People see it mm. as less complex. And generally it's um, uh, not as well compensated and uh, people think it requires less formal training, right? Mm. Um, so that's kind of like my outside of architecture preamble. And then mm. within architecture, I also see even within like that kind of more niche uh, application, there are still a couple different ways that it's used. So, um, the first is kind of out of science and technology studies where people use care to mean maintenance. So like um, synonyms might be preservation or cleaning or repair. So uh, Stephen Jackson's Rethinking Repair like uses the word care a lot, but it's not how I would use the word care. Um, and then another framing in architecture kind of looks at um, uh, architecture as a more passive way of kind of housing or providing for these very specific care processes. So uh, writing about kind of the interactions between these two independent domains so care and architecture on the other hand right um so scholarship on hospice architecture i would place under this category um because they kind of ask how does a specific given architecture either hinder or support existing care work um processes or activities right mm -hmm. um and these, these takes, in my opinion, kind of tend to be a little divorced from the larger philosophy of care or architecture. And so the third way that I'm kind of using in my work is um, attempting to group these different architectures cross typologically. So instead of having care and environment or architecture on like two separate ends of the conversation, I'm trying to kind of combine them into a third separate entity. So a care architecture. Um, where uh, they are designed to house this explicit care work, but can also kind of contribute to the processes or relations or um, uh, situations that play out within them, right? Mm. So I guess my answer is like, it's a lot of different things. It's complicated outside of architecture. It's complicated within architecture. And so for that reason, the first step in my work has kind of been just figuring out what what do I mean? Like, what do mm. I mean? And I kind of tried to get to that point by mixing and uh, mixing together all these other definitions. It's, it's interesting you mentioned um, the role of gender in doing care work. And we're going to get to that a little um, later. Uh, but I want to pick up on the last point that you mentioned about uh, the architectures of care. And of course, your uh, PhD work is looking at centered around the design of care environments. So if you could go into a little bit of depth and talk about what encompasses the care infrastructure, like the physical care infrastructure. Yeah. Um, so I guess right at the top, again, I will just say that I, I'm, one could argue just about anything to be care infrastructure but with that in mind I'll again just kind of answer within the just to, just to poke I'm you a little in. bit do you do you yeah. think a house qualifies as a place for care like I definitely think there's a way that that yeah you could write a paper with that as the argument right and I'm sure many have <laughs> um I yeah and so I think I think there's ways that you could kind of pick almost any uh you could you could argue that, you know, a school is a care environment or, mm. um, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of care because there are so many care functions and definitions of care, then necessarily there are so many spaces that could yeah. be sort of allied with those functions. Um, but I think, I think it is important to start with kind of the, the briefest possible historical context. So, um, uh, just to kind of get to this, uh, this place where we're even able to talk about kind of what I mean by care architectures. But so in the 
English speaking Western world, like at the beginning of the 20th century, the hospital was this place that nobody wanted to go. Um, we were scared of contagion, transmission of disease. Um, people who could afford it would choose to receive private care at home. So you would have a, a doctor or a nurse come see you at home because you didn't want to mess with kind of the public dirty um, hospital that other people, if they didn't have uh, means, would have to end up there, right? Um, and then there was, and again, I'm simplifying this history, but just um, in the interest of brevity, there was a huge period where the focus was on kind of technological advance, um, hospital reform period, efficiency was a really important concern at this time too. And so through kind of the 1920s, the hospital sort of became not a last resort anymore. Like people kind of associated um, these institutions with a really sort of technological efficient scientific cure. So people mm. started to believe actually it might be better for me to go to this institution, um, receive my, my care uh, and be cured here. Um, and relatedly, like at this time, a lot of hospitals started to be affiliated with universities or there were like teaching hospitals. And so that kind of also contributed to this image of the hospital as kind of cutting edge at the forefront of, you know, medical advancement. Um, and then the pendulum, of course, swings back. And by the 60s, the hospitals are seen as uh, too efficient and too scientific and not very caring, right? So it's it's literally like kind the of processes become more mechanical. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in the in the interest of efficiency, maybe um, people are not getting to spend as much time with the nurse, right? As opposed to if the nurse is coming to your house, um, they're going to be like really taking care of you, focused on you for a given amount of time. Um, so yeah, you can see how things like you know technology, science, efficiency. Uh, when taken to an extreme can kind of contribute to that perception of uh, being in conflict with a certain definition of care, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is around the same time that new sort of health related facilities besides the hospital came to be. And so that's the, the moment that I begin my dissertation study. So um, I am looking at uh, the 1960s to the 1990s. So right at this period where these mm -hmm. new facilities are um, and uh, I, I am focusing on, so the 60s was a big decade for um, um, subsidized or like public long-term care facilities. And then in the 70s, you have the first residential hospice uh, in North America. Uh, and then in the 80s, uh, the first pediatric, so children's hospice in the world opened in, uh, in Oxford in the UK. So that's kind of why I choose that moment. Um, and so to go back to the cure care dichotomy in the hospital success or like a yeah success has historically been really intertwined with cure mm -hmm. right um, mm -hmm. and because of that my argument is that the hospital isn't really an adequate model if we're talking about care environments right like neither philosophically or uh, theoretically and certainly not architecturally um, because these environments subvert this like medical model of care and also these older typologies so it is my sort of proposal that that scholarship should treat them as separate and significant in their own right so I guess that's kind of like my framing of care mm. infrastructure comes from um and yeah just just carving out place for them to be sort of separate and by virtue of that important mm. um in 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 the four or five different typologies that you mentioned, I found your observation about the adjacent typologies very pertinent to how we look at care facilities. And you kind of note that the design of care environments, whether they are hospices or long-term care residences, is far removed from the architecture of hospitals and architects who design these care facilities. And you're saying that these care facilities actually took cues from domestic architecture and residential mm -hmm. building typologies. Can you share a few instances from your research that trace the evolution of these typologies? Because, I mean, I was when I was going through stuff and I extensively went through a bibliography and I was trying to get a hang of things, mm -hmm. it, it seemed like this new emergent typology or like the multiple variations of it have 
taken the best from what a house or a residential typology has to offer and then added a layer of medical care on top of it. So it's not necessarily medicine at the forefront with care that is more residential, but kind of the other way around. Um, mm -hmm. how, do, how do you think that that emerged? Or was there like a gradual evolution in, in terms of how they, they grew and how they eventually took space in a city? Yeah, yeah I mean, um, so when I mentioned that in the, in the 70s and 80s, there was an entirely new kind of architecture that was emerging. So that being the, the freestanding residential hospice. So um, and then the pediatric hospice. So literally a place where people go to um, receive care for the last, usually it's in the last, I mean, in the States, uh, I believe it's in the last six months of life. Um, so because of this new, or I won't say because of, because that sort of implies a certain dynamic between the two, but in relation to a new philosophy, which was the hospice philosophy, um, this new architectural typology emerged as well. So, you know, you know, whatever the relationship was there, I have yet to kind of um, decide for myself whether it's sort of a cause and effect thing either way. But um, essentially, advocates of the hospice movement thought that the traditional healthcare system wasn't focused on the right thing. So as we just kind of talked about, like cure was always sort of king, even when it was very clear that a patient like with cancer, for example, a certain uh, stage and type of cancer, even when it's clear that a patient would or could not ever be cured, um, healthcare providers would often still spend their time and resources on attempts at cure. Um, and so advocates for this hospice movement thought that if the patient was the focus instead of, of this cure or instead of the illness itself, um, then care and kind of alleviating suffering would could then be the primary concern of healthcare providers right so, and so just to clarify sorry yeah do do you think was there an alternate to the hospice before the formalization of hospices in the 1960s or was it an entirely new form and institution yeah, that um, just emerged post like world war ii if if yeah, they were ever related were there were two, like, I mean, the options before having a dedicated place to spend um, your end of life, the options were either receiving end of life care in the hospital, which is mm. an institution that's not, as we've learned, that is not set up for that. Um, physicians and healthcare professionals did not receive like specific training in the alleviation of suffering at the end of life with like, you know, serious terminal illness, mm. um, or you would be sick at home right and so we'll talk I'm sure later about kind of like who uh that hmm. care works offloaded hmm. onto but um so those are the options or you know as a, a option b to the hospital you might end up in a long-term care home or you know like a nursing home right. um but there was no sort of specialized option where everything was focused on your situation if yes. that makes sense hmm. um yeah so uh, it kind of follows that the environments designed to house and support those curative practices and activities would also not be right if we were to shift the focus to the patient or to, to you know, care at face value. Um, and so, like I said, my, my work looks specifically at the architectural results of these changes in attitude. So the hospice philosophy, resulted in the residential hospice and then later the pediatric hospice um, and public long-term care homes also had their own kind of associated philosophies of care um, that led to them changing or existing differently. Um, and so the first hospice is explicitly set out to be the opposite of a hospital. And a lot of the planners, like when I'm um, mm doing my archival research, a lot of the people who were not architects, but they would be, you know, the, the champions of the hospice movement, they would specifically say this, they would say, we don't want it to look like a hospital. Instead, we want mm -hmm. it to be small, comfortable, easy to navigate. Like they have all these ideas of what a hospital is and, and therefore what they didn't want, right? Um, and so uh, the, and the architecture of hospitals uh, like reflect cultural attitudes about death and dying. Like right. the, um, 
even hospital palliative care units are, are never kind of front and center on the first floor right by the entrance, right? Like they're going to be relegated to a higher floor or the back of the building. Like it's not something that that any hospital wants to advertise. Mm. Um, and even kind of storage space or transportation space for dead bodies is like, you know, it's it's a whole thing. It's not going to be sort of front and center. But um, as you mentioned, like architects have looked to domestic architecture right. because they've assumed that that's going to be the most comforting thing. Like if you can't be at home, we'll try to make this facility look like what we think your home might look like. Right. Mm. Um, and so um, things like uh, a lot of sort of decor tricks, like um, having fireplaces or like certain kinds of furniture oh, or interesting. window sills. Yeah. Um, which I mean, opens up a whole other can of worms sort of in terms of problematics. My doctoral supervisor, um, Anne-Marie Adams, she has written about why that's problematic because of course, who decides, like they, they often lean on a really specific middle-class vision of what a home looks like. Like who's to say that that's going to be comforting to everybody who comes mm. into the hospital. Right? Um, but, uh, yeah. And so this has led to a really, really interesting problem, which or like a design and conceptual problem, which is the lack of a distinct typology for these environments. And so um, the architectural historian, Charles Jenks, who was one of the co-founders of the Maggie Centers, um, the Maggie Centers are, are a series of day centers in the UK um, uh, for cancer patients. Um, and Charles Jenks being an architect, uh, himself kind of started this movement where all these, you know, famous star architects, you might call them, like designed their own sort of cancer center. So like the Hadid did one, um, huge names kind of bringing uh, architectural attention to cancer care, which is, you know, interesting. But um, he famously referred to these centers as non-types. So mm. like for Charles Banks, he presents that the type is just a non-type, like that's a proper noun um, in this context. Um, and so the bulk of the existing discourse around these buildings really focuses on what these buildings should not be and should not represent or like should not reference rather than what they ought to be or what they are in practice. Mm. Um, so there's this tension of like making reference to domestic space to encourage, you know, patient comfort but also referencing institutional space enough so that family members believe that their loved one is in good hands. Um, and so it has to be home-like, but it's not a home and it's hospital-like, but it can't be an institution. It's this whole like tension. Um, and so in order to design for these contexts, you kind of have to know, like to know what is missing, you have to know what could have been there, right? Mm. right? So you kind of, you have to have an intimate knowledge of domestic architecture, of hospital architecture, of like these different typologies in order to kind of whittle them away and reveal the hospice non-type, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Um, so, so my my work or my interest was kind of born out of that challenge. Like how would care environments be different if we could even adequately speak about them, right? Yeah. Has it, has it yeah, changed from, from, from when... Charles Yang's called it a non-type to say 2023 now. I'm sure the Zaha Hadid building wouldn't be that old, but in the current discourse of care design, do you think it has now found like a place in terms of being identified as an architectural typology? Or do you still think there's so much room for interpretation that it for the lack of a better definition continues to be a non-type or has there been, I don't know, you know, like have you set out to design a hospital that are now a lot of rules, a lot of guidelines, a lot of bylaws in place that govern simple things like the room of an operation, design of an operation theater, circulation lift, um, mm -hmm. design for disability, you know, whatever. But is has there been any progress on on this front or not really? It's definitely changing. So even with hospital design, like we're already seeing some of those things that I mentioned about kind of relegating palliative care to the, the back corner. Um, mm -hmm. We're seeing changes in that, that respect. Um, and definitely over the last 10, maybe even less than 10 years, like se six, seven years, 
there's been a lot more um, scholarship on hospice architecture and, and end of life architecture. Um, and I mean, certainly since the pandemic, like long-term care uh, infrastructure has has kind of come into the spotlight and, and been revealed to be quite problematic too. So we're kind of like at an interesting moment where many more people are talking about it. So I anticipate that in the near future, like that will be somewhere that we can, that's kind of like an end point that we can arrive at, but I don't think it's there yet. And I think another problem is that there is so little, there's kind of a problem of precision when we're talking about these environments, like, like for example, the Maggie centers, um, they're not uh, residential, like they're day centers for people with cancer. So, oh, so for somebody who wants to go get like chemotherapy or something like throughout the day would go and then leave by night, is it? Yeah, so it's not residential, exactly. So it's like okay. um, day programs like um, spiritual care or like, oh. you know, group group discussion, that kind of thing. So it's like a beautiful place to go receive different kinds of social support um, during the day. But it's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of the big books on hospice architecture include the Maggie centers um, because they're probably the most well-known kind of cancer architecture in the world. But programmatically, like I say, like they're, it's very different from the needs or the requirements of a residential hospice because, you know, it's not 24 seven care. So it's kind of interesting there too, because, um, because there are so few people writing about it. And like I say, it is, it is um, kind of coming into the forefront, but with so mm. few people talking about it and um, the, the discourse just really being at this early stage, like there's just so, uh, there's really a need for precision in language and kind of collaboration across disciplines to kind of get to a point where we can figure out if a distinct typology is necessary, what that typology would mean, how do we achieve it? Mm. I want to turn back to something that you mentioned uh, early on about the role of gender. And I want to reference something that I saw a couple of weeks ago on Netflix. So there's this documentary called work working give me one sec I'm gonna check I think it's working I think it's uh, working yeah yeah it's it's working and it is hosted by Barack Obama and he <laughs> takes a deep dive into the nature of work and he looks at three different industries so he does like a case study of people working at different levels in a hotel uh, New York hotel um, so that's the hospitality industry and he looks like an autonomous driving vehicle company so the tech industry and he looks at the nature of work in this organization which train and um, train staff to go provide care in mostly senior citizen households so the so the care industry and something he, he talks about it explicitly but it was quite evident that the presence of women was ubiquitous mm -hmm. when it came to the care industry which was not the case in the other two segments um mm -hmm. hospitality maybe of course he looks at people right from the ceo to people who are working in uh um what do you call it uh housekeeping so of mm -hmm. course there there were women at the lower level in housekeeping. Um, maybe some of them were working in catering, food and beverage. But in this particular company, the, the care industry, it was predominantly women. And this is also something that we spoke about when we were part of Women in Design. And we often spoke about the role of care uh, in how labor is acknowledged or recognized and how a lot of care work that women do in their day-to-day -day lives is is not accounted for is is not compensated for and so now that you're looking at care in a slightly more formal manner as a doctoral dissertation um, and you're also looking at its relationship to the feminist theory and the movement that was going on at the time throw some throw some line on on the nexus and and everything floating in the space. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I'm I'm happy you brought up women in design. Um, I haven't, yeah, it just like brings me back to our thesis semester at the at the GSD. Um,
which is related. Uh, my my master's thesis, uh, supervised by John Peterson, um, was kind of an attempt to map care ethics onto the practice and profession of architecture. And um, care ethics is kind of a, a moral framework that has in some ways sort of been debunked or, or problematized um, since, but um, not since my thesis, but since the, the care ethics came out. Um, but that sort of argues or comes out of a place uh, where a lot of Western moral thought has kind of foregrounded rationality or like male um, values, like traditionally associated with men, rationality, um, logic, these kinds of things. And so the um, the scholars who propose this alternative, so um, Nell Nodding's Carol Gilligan um, kind of argued that there's, there's a way to foreground instead kind of empathy and relationality instead of rationality um, and more mm -hmm. sort of typically feminine values in the way that we make, uh, in the way that we carry out ethical decision-making or moral decision-making in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, which I bring that up only because like kind of no matter how you slice care, there's always a gendered dimension. Mm -hmm. um, and so the um, an important place to start with the, um, the Netflix documentary is that not only is the care work uh, largely carried out by women, but even just evident in the sort of microcosm of that documentary, like race, class, immigration status also plays a huge role in the story. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's not difficult to see how that is very closely related to like the constant uh, undervaluation or invisibility of care work and care workers, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of mirrors in a way the the ways that like the architectures of aging and dying are everywhere in our cities, but like still remain sort of socially, culturally, literally invisible. Um, and I was just before getting on this call, I was rereading uh, a book called The Care Crisis um, by Emma Dowling. I believe she's um, British, but she has this concept that she calls care offloading, um, whereby instead of, you know, production, if you picture like a factory, instead of production moving to a place where labor is cheaper with care work, um, the workers move or are kind of recruited to move to a place where care work is needed. And mm. it's often, um, it, it's actually kind of gets into the nitty gritty of sort of, um, you know, feminist thinking, which is like, it's often white and middle-class women who offload their care work to other women, right? Like women of color or sort of lower, um, yeah class women or immigrants or whatever. So um, it's it's such a complicated um, conversation, but it is just interesting how, uh, like I say, no, there are so many definitions to the word care, but sort of no matter how you get at it, there is still this sort of gendered or sort of inequity piece. Um, but uh, yeah, so like I say, my my dissertation takes one care environment from each uh, decade and place. So in the 60s, I'm focusing on the work of um, uh, Canadian architect Pamela Clough. So she was a big figure in long-term care in, in Ontario, Canada. Um, and then for the 70s, I'm looking at uh, uh, architect Lo Yi Chan's design for the first residential hospice in North America, which is was in Connecticut. Um, and then, like I mentioned, uh, John Bicknell's design for Helen House, which was the first um, pediatric hospice in the world, mm -hmm. and it's in the UK. Um, but so what's interesting with this, with the work and kind of, as I said, the sort of surprises at every turn that it does keep coming back to sort of uh, gender and feminist theory and and kind of women's work um, is that even with the latter two projects and, and chapters that I'm writing, despite the architects being men, I have found that these projects each had non-architect women incredibly involved in the actual architectural processes themselves. So these are women not with architectural backgrounds, but with backgrounds in either professional caring, so um, nurses or um, uh, religious figures or, um, or women with, um, 
just care roles within their own families. So um, a woman who was really involved in the establishment of the pediatric hospice um, was a woman named Jacqueline Worswick, and she she cared for her own child who was terminally ill and was because of that really involved in the architecture and the setup of that hospice. So um, it's it's just interesting how even if I don't explicitly go out looking for this sort of gendered connections, which I kind of am doing, but um, they still reveal themselves uh, as part of this like narrative about the in invisible contributions of of these women to the resulting care architecture. So not only do women kind of invisibly contribute to care and the care work, but I'm also finding this parallel narrative of women kind of invisibly contributing to the architectures of care themselves. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure, I don't know if they were recognized as contributors to the project or were they always still at the at the back foot as they mostly yeah, it, are in such projects? Yeah, <laughs> there's a range. Like um, in the context of the Connecticut hospice, there are a lot of women sort of central characters to that story, but they're central for their, um, their work. Uh, like the, the literal example is um, Florence Wald, who was Dean of the Yale School of Nursing. Um, she was, you know, one of the founders of the first hospice, residential hospice in North America. Um, and so she's very well known and kind of credited for her nursing role. But I, I think it's interesting how uh, when I go through the day-to-day -day documents of the establishment of that hospice, she was so incredibly involved in turning the brief into the finalized like realized architectural project so she's recognized as a nurse but um she also had a really sort of central and um important hand in the development of the architecture specifically uh and it's kind of the same thing with um the helen house story of um uh women kind of being credited for their sort of literal on paper role, but then discovering these kind of almost under the table contributions in different mm. ways and real interactions with the architecture itself and the architect. Mm. So you're three years into your doctoral yeah. study. Um, <laughs> where are you with the research? What's next? And what do you, what do you plan on doing with this wonderful topic and if you want to also talk about your engagement uh your recent engagement with the with the new organization yeah, yeah um so yeah I'm I'm just finishing my third year so I'm trucking along hoping you know the next year or two to have like a full draft put together um I am traveling to the UK in October to um do some kind of final archival research mm. uh on um on the pediatric hospice out there. Um, so yeah, still still very much getting there. Um, and then, yeah, like you mentioned, I, I also am working with um, the Canadian Palliative Care Research Collaborative. Um, so I'm doing that kind of in parallel and it's really interesting to, to have that more direct contact with people who do this kind of work. Um, so it's actually pairing quite nicely with my dissertation of, of having this real like architectural history context and we're working with my uh, my supervisor, my you know peers at McGill, and then also having this mm -hmm. piece where I get to actually work every day with um, you know um, palliative care uh, providers and mm -hmm. researchers and patients and caregivers. So. Um, yeah, hopefully like a year or two years, but it's it's kind of all coming together quite nicely right now. Very excited for you. And I'm really looking forward to the dream you're living of having a doctor in front of your name. So <laughs> good luck with that. And thank you for this conversation. Thank you, Vaishnavi. So nice to talk with you again. Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. You can follow us on Instagram at Arc of Center and reach out to us through our website arcofcenter.com. That is A R C H O F F C E N T R E. And thanks for listening.